First things first, we will likely have to mention this quite often, but we have not mentioned it at the beginning of an episode yet, which is we have a new podcast. If you don't usually make it to the end of this podcast, you probably had no idea. And if you're not a newsletter subscriber, actually, even if you are a newsletter subscriber, it's very possible you did not see this email because let's be honest, a lot of people subscribe to newsletters and never read them or or wait for a long time. So I am making a very concerted effort today to let you know about our new private exclusive podcast called This Hits the Spot. Now, before you feel overwhelmed about adding another podcast list, or perhaps you're the complete opposite and you're very, very excited about it, let me give you a quick overview. It's basically making up for or replacing, it's a better term, what we used to do at the end of episodes. So again, if you're someone who doesn't usually make it towards the end of our episodes, you may not even know that we do this. But for a long time, off and on, not incredibly consistently, we would talk about our favorite products and services at the end of the episodes. We really enjoyed doing that. And we thought, you know, let's cut that out and paste that into another private podcast exclusively for people who subscribe to our newsletters and or are supporting us on Patreon. We wanted to give some extra perks, some incentives for our newsletter subscribers to thank them because we know inboxes can get very cluttered. And we especially want to thank our patrons for supporting the shows financially. Plus, we wanted to play around with a brand new tool. So we created This Hits the Spot which is a shorter podcast, about 20 minutes in length. We tried to keep it to five to 10 minutes long, but we found out we, we are, well, I was going to say we're not capable of that, Jason, but I know we're capable. It's just we choose not to. <laughs> just like this show could be a lot shorter, but we choose to keep it whatever length we want. So the other show is significantly shorter than this show, 20 minutes long. We rave about products and services. As of right now, we have two episodes out, but who knows? By the time you listen, there'll probably be more because we release a new episode every week. And Jason, the last two episodes, we we mentioned seven products per episode. So that might be our, our average, but there are no rules, just like there are no rules on this show. This hits the spot. The only rule, if there is one, is for that show to be more uplifting, more positive, We wanted it to kind of be like the antithesis of this show in that if you ever feel like hmm, a little low energy after listening because we get into some deep things here, a little sad, perhaps maybe similar to how you feel if you watch the Bo Burnham special that we talked about last week, uh, we want you to feel uplifted and we want you to know that there are a ton of amazing foods, beverages, supplements, uh, online programs, books, other podcasts, like all sorts of amazing things out there that bring each of us joy. And it's been our passion for many years outside of the podcast for us to talk about products and services. And now that Jason is off Instagram, at least for the foreseeable future, he's going to need an outlet to talk about products he loves. So that's actually a good place to start beyond the show. Well, let me say uh, for anyone who's curious, And how do you get access to This Hits a Spot? If you're already a newsletter subscriber, we've been sending out little um, tidbits about it each week. If you are Patreon, it's very obvious because it's right there front and center for you. You just sign up as a Patreon, but if a patron, but if you don't want to financially support us, that's fine. That's your prerogative. Uh, You can just sign up for free using our newsletter. And once you do, uh, there's a way to opt in to the podcast or you can go to wellevator.com slash this, this hits the spot. I think there's um, uh, like dashes in between each word, but it'll be really easy for you if you look in the show notes for this episode to find that link. And if you're having trouble, I have a feeling if you do a search for this hits the spot, you should find it. I have not even tried that myself yet. This hits the spot podcast. Let's see what comes up. It is not fully ranked in uh, Google yet, but if you have any trouble, you can DM us on Instagram. You can send us an email, but if you go to our website, wellevator.com, it's on there. If you go to to the podcast section, 
it's on there. If you go to the show notes for this episode at wellevator.com, it's definitely on there. And if you haven't visited wellevator.com yet, that's spelled W-E-L-L-E-V-A-T-R.com. So with that complete, Jason, I'm curious, how have you been feeling since you deactivated your Instagram account, your personal, not the Wellevator. The Wellevator Instagram account is still up and running, but I think it'd be great for you to share your your decision to pause the Jason Robel Instagram account and how you've been feeling since you did that and how long do you anticipate not using that personal account? Well, I deactivated it about, I think, four days ago. Um, I reactivated it this morning to post pod- podcast clips. Um, but I'm not, I'm not actively engaging with it and I will probably deactivate it again, to be honest with you, because what I've noticed over the past, um, four days since I stopped using my personal account is I feel a lot more mental space, Whitney. I feel a sense of really not feeling bound to keep up on other people's lives that I don't know. I don't feel bound by the um, incessant, almost unconscious desire to pick up my phone constantly. It's really made an interesting difference. So I I posted clips today um, for our podcast on my personal account, but I I don't know that I see the long-term value in being on Instagram anymore, personally, not for Wellevator, but for me personally. And, and here's one of the reasons. We've talked about this in a previous episode. I don't recall which one. Maybe you'll jump in and remember, Whitney. But we were talking about the anthropological and sociological research that shows that our human ancestors in you know very small agrarian tribal societies didn't know more than, say, 100 to 200 humans their entire life. And the theory is that our neurophysiology has not adapted really beyond that, that in terms of close people that we know by name, that our brains are still wired to only be able to successfully maintain about 100 to 200 human relationships. And what I started realizing was that, you know, all of the DMs on every platform, people commenting, people sending messages, it's neurologically overwhelming to me to maintain that many connections with that many human beings. It's overwhelming. It, it fries my nervous system. And the other part of it too, that I think I mentioned in private, I don't think I mentioned it here on the podcast, is that I'm really being mindful, especially because you and I are going to, to one of the first like public events that we've been to. You and I actually have not been, I don't think, to a public event together since the very beginning of the pandemic, as far as I recall, like this, I think is the first, like tonight we're going, we're going to a very small, uh, uh, outing, a a debut in LA for, um, a a waste free store. And all that being said, I'm taking inventory of the quality of the relationships in my life. And here's what I mean by that. If I shut down or deactivate all of my social media, the people that I'm really close to, they can call me, they can text me because they have my phone number. Uh, they can email me because they have my direct email, which is all, it's also public on the internet. Or they physically know where I live. They actually have my address, right? So if you're a human being that falls out of that category, doesn't have my phone number, doesn't know how to text me, email, or physically come visit me, at the risk of sounding really a bit blunt, you're probably not that important to me. That, that, that sounds blunt. I know when I say that, but when I say that, it doesn't mean that I don't value my business relationships. It doesn't mean I don't value um, the, the people that we work with in those kind of contexts, but I'm talking about an interpersonal deep type of connection. If the only way that we're connected is on Instagram, it's not that deep of a relationship, period. It really just isn't. So it's me taking inventory of how social media sometimes skews the importance. Like, I got to respond to all these DMs. I've got to get to all these posts. Not really. And I've also realized, and this might fly in the face of advice from some social media people, I don't feel the need to respond to comments. Like, I don't even want to respond to comments anymore because it's exhausting. 
and that's, you know, thousands of human connections I don't have the capacity for neurologically. So the long answer is I briefly went back onto post clips. I'm not engaging with DMs. I might deact actually de deactivate DMs. Um, but I have felt better in the last four days. I've just felt more spacious, Whitney. I felt less anxiety. And to be honest, I don't fucking miss it. I don't miss Instagram at all. There's not a fiber of my being that misses it. Well, I'm not surprised. <laughs> and I have been reflecting on it myself. I feel like Instagram tends to be feel more of like a chore than a joy. There are elements, though, of connection that I've really appreciated. I mean, we actually get most of the, of the feedback on this podcast via Instagram. So for that reason, I feel like the Wellevator Instagram account is really nice. And one thing with you, Jason, that you sounded really frustrated by was just like other people's posts on Instagram. And certainly you can solve that by unfollowing or just not looking at the feed. When I started my Wit Lauritsen Instagram account, which I'm aiming to be my main account if I ever make it that far, <laughs> like if I spend enough time on Instagram for that to even be worth it, that's usually where I direct people to unless for some reason I want to impress them with my larger following on Ego B and Gal, which is so silly, but unfortunately, that's the way a lot of people's brains work. Uh, so with Wit Lords and only having like 200 plus people on it, it's not as impressive as approximately 17,000 on Instagram, on my Eco Vegan Gal account. Um, but that doesn't deeply matter to me. My point being that I'm very mindful of who I follow on either account, but especially the, the Wit Lords and account because. I don't want to fall into the comparison trap. Like I truly want to see content that brings me joy from people that I know to your point, Jason, and, or people that I just admire, like Celeste Headley, who is on our show. I mean, I love just seeing her because she posts pictures of her dogs and like quote normal things. And I just love her spirit. I love Elizabeth Gilbert's spirit. I've never even communicated with her. So that's a little bit different than just following friends. And then there are friends that I don't follow anymore. I've unfollowed them. Or sometimes if I feel uncomfortable unfollowing them, I've muted them so I don't see their content because it can feel awkward to unfollow someone. Some, sometimes people notice, which is I think we've talked about before on the show. It's so interesting when people notice that you've unfollowed them because I don't even know how to see how somebody if somebody unfollowed me. The only person, Jason, that I've checked to see if she's still following me is Marion Williamson. <laughs> like literally, that's the only person I think I've ever, well, I shouldn't say ever, but like consciously and, and recently checked. And I haven't even checked recently, but it, it because it, it makes me feel good that Marion Williamson follows me. And I don't even know if she chose or like someone on her staff chose to follow me, but like I took that as a lot of pride. Uh, for a while. And it was kind of cool because it inspired me to post content that felt more in alignment with my spirit because I wanted her to continue following me. And like, I just admire and appreciate Marianne's work. And I, I didn't know if I would ever show up in her feed, but I thought like, if I, if I do, I'd rather it come across as like rich, meaningful content versus superficial, egotistic trying to get validation type of content. Anyways, um, the reason that I bring this up is because I have been reading a book that is a fascinating perspective on, on technology. And I just pulled up some summaries because I haven't finished it yet. And I recognize that I haven't made it to the part that I think is going to most excite me. So this may be a two-part episode, and certainly we can talk about the first section of the book and its perspectives on technology. But the second part apparently gets into social media. So I feel a little disappointed that I haven't made it that far yet. I actually almost gave up on reading the book because I was starting to feel like it wasn't super valuable to me. But now that I know 
that there's more uh, and that it gets into different subject matters. I'm really excited. So this book is called Alone Together by Shelly Turkle, right? Shelly. Hold on. I want to make sure I say Yeah. Sherry. See, I, I had a feeling it wasn't quite right. Sherry Turkle. And this was recommended by at least two people. I don't remember where I initially heard about it, but the main focus of the book is how humans interact with technology and why they expect more from it. And Sherry uh, was a scientist or a psychologist who is studying artificial intelligence in the 1970s and has done a number of studies uh, over the years as it's evolved. Um, much of the book has focused on things like um, toys that kids have played with, like Tamagotchis, Furbies, these robotic dogs that I, I'm not very familiar with called Abos, A-I-B-O, or I assume it's pronounced Abo. Um, I distinctly remember Tamagotchi. I don't recall if I had my own. I think I did. Furby, I didn't. I also don't think I ever had one of my own, but my sister did, my sister being a few years younger than me. So I got to experience some of the, quote, younger spectrum of the millennial generation. And uh, there, it's fascinating to read how she was studying the way kids interacted and the responsibility that they had with this form of technology. And I have a bunch of quotes that I want to share and just the the development in in some ways it felt like that technology was designed to distract us to entertain us just like a lot of toys are uh, but also I wonder and I don't know if she made this point or will make this point in the book I wonder if that technology was designed to get us used to AI like, let's subtly bring it into our lives so that by the time AI becomes really big, like, it's not a big deal. It's not as shocking to us because we've been playing with, with it since we were kids. And it's especially fascinating, the Furby section, which, again, got a little redundant for me. It's, it's definitely a very scientific book. So I think I love research, but at a certain point, my eyes start to glaze over. There's so much detail about Furbies, like a whole either chapter or a, whole, a huge chunk of a chapter dedicated to them. And it's fascinating at times, though, like how kids were responding to them and treating them almost as if they were real. And one of the big points that Sherry makes is how do we even define what's real? And I thought that was a really, pun intended, interesting question. So before we get into the, some of this, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I want to share some of these quotes and reflect upon them. And hopefully they're not too out of context for me to remember what the context is. But towards the beginning of the book, she said, these days, insecure in our relationships and anxious about intimacy, we look to technology for ways to be in relationships and protect ourselves from them at the same time. We look for ways to be in relationships and protect ourselves from them at the same time through technology, which I thought was such a fascinating statement. And that summarizes a huge interpretation that I have of the title Alone Together. And in the introduction of the book, she really gets into that about how technology serves us and doesn't serve us in so many ways, um, how we objectify and discard people through technology. She was specifically talking about chat roulette. Remember that, Jason? <laughs> it's called Omegle now, I think. I, I don't know if it's the same company, maybe a separate company, but same idea where you can go and meet random strangers. And Jason's probably laughing and thinking about, uh, what was his name? Steve. Well, we can't call him. Is he a friend? Come on. Oh, okay. We've met him. Yes. I, I had years ago, like Steve and I were in a program together and I had many interactions with him. Uh, but I wouldn't call him a friend, not 
to be offensive, but simply he's truly an acquaintance. But we did have the chance. I would like to look up him. I wonder how he's doing because he rode the wave of fame or or notoriety or whatever through uh, a video, uh, several videos he did on Chat Roulette where he was singing that song. Hey, nice to meet you. Has that how it went? Call me maybe. Yeah. But that's how he went. Was it? Hey, nice to meet you. Here's my number. Yeah. We'll link to that in the show notes. It's a really fun video. And it was all done through chat roulette. But this point of people being objectified and quickly discarded. I mean, chat roulette, that's exactly what it was like. I actually, Jason found through going through some old hard drives i found video screen recordings i made of me using chat roulette i don't even know why i made these i was probably going to integrate them into a video don't know if i ever did but i have them from probably 2010 maybe a little earlier i don't remember exactly when it started but it's interesting even watching them back how you would go on there and you would just wait for someone to entertain you in some way. If anyone's ever used them, you would just like sit there and be like, okay, like what's this person got to say or do? And I don't know in the beginning if there was audio. I remember like a lot of typing in the chat. Now I think it's mostly video, like audio um, verbalizations, but, but it was, fascinating how you would be on the edge and I'm sure you still are if you use Omegle or whatever else is out there where you don't know which what you're going to experience and it actually could make it very dangerous there was a lot of pornography there were people flashing each other like that was like the known risk that you would take that you might see someone's penis or someone doing some lewd act but again they're trying to get a literal rise out of you in some cases you know but like or somebody's turned on by strangers seeing them, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like no shame except, well, I guess what could be wrong is if kids are seeing it and the inappropriate dynamics that could come out of that or, or, or traumatic responses. So I'm not, I'm not shaming someone's sexual desires, but there's a time and a place for each of them, I suppose. And I think chat roulette is so fascinating for that reason, but it's not the only platform. I mean, certainly uh, online dating feels that way, that you can quickly discard someone. You can swipe past them. You can have a conversation and completely ghost them. The amount of times that happened to me, and I'm sure you've talked about this in some of our like relationship episodes, Jason, but I imagine for guys too, that girls like, never respond and you put all this effort into a cool pickup line and a conversation and then like you think you're getting somewhere and then someone just ghosts you or you even go on a date with somebody and we live in a time where you can pick your next person on your phone as soon as you leave a date so if you don't like that date you're like done next move on and you literally are discarding somebody and on to the next and to me that's a frightening element of technology I want to go back to one thing you said uh, about chat roulette, which was like this sort of unspoken uh, agreement that, uh, you know, I need to be entertained by this person. And I think that part of the reason that I am backing away from my personal social media for now is what feels like an unspoken pressure. And I'm wondering if you agree with this, Whitney to either be profound all of the time, right? I I can't just post this picture. I need to spend 30 minutes writing this extremely deep, profound, reflective caption that somehow exudes the deeper meaning and significance of the photo or the video. Like it's not just posting. It's I need to craft some compelling prose that's going to move someone emotionally. It's like, is that even authentic? I mean, it's, it's, it's tough, it's tough to, you know, you talked about the word real. It's like, what the fuck does that even mean anymore? What does authentic even mean anymore? I mean, a lot of these words, it, 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 it's sort of difficult to even separate these conversations because I think it goes back to a question of intent. 
You know, why are you posting what you're posting? Are you posting it to get attention? Are you posting it to seem profound and intelligent and successful to people? Are you doing it to get a reaction? I mean, it, it's, I think, I think no matter what, it's important to really get clear as individuals of why we're posting what we're posting. But in that, I feel there's a constant pressure, Whitney, to be profound, to, to, to write something meaningful that's going to move someone, that's going to entertain someone. It's like years ago, this was maybe like 20, 2014 or 2015. Um, our, my, my former assistant, dear friend I've known for many years, you know her to her name is uh, El Marquis. Uh, she has a great vintage shop we've talked about here in LA, Marquis Moon. She was assisting me for years on my cookbook, my YouTube channel. She's an amazing chef. She had a friend who was posting something like five, six years ago, Whitney, called Normcore. And I was like, what is Normcore? And she said, well, it's these artists who are posting things that are in direct response to this constant pressure to be profound all the time. I'm like, well, what, what kind of things do they post? Like vacuuming their carpet, cleaning their kitchen scooping the shit out of the litter box, like norm core. Like this is my daily life. There's no pretense. There's no roomy quote under the video. You know, there's not some Sufi wisdom. It's just here I am vacuuming my fucking carpet. Here I am cleaning my car. Here I am scooping cat poop. And I thought that was really interesting. I, I don't know whatever happened to norm core. I've, I actually haven't looked at that hashtag in years, but that was the first time I remember kind of a group of creators posting things that seem to be in defiance of the constant pressure to be profound and significant. It's like, nope, here I am vacuuming. That's it. No caption, no explanation. Just a vacuum and a carpet. And I just thought that was fascinating. So I don't know, may maybe I'll do some new version of Normcore where it's the opposite of profound. You know, like here I am like, like you know, shaving the inside of my nose because I actually have a lot. And on the other thing about aging real quick, uh, I've noticed that I have hair in my ears now, Whitney. The other day, I looked in the mirror. I was like, "Oh, I have, I have, I have hair growing out of my ears now. Interesting, interesting." Like I remember as a kid, like my grandpa had hair in his ears, and I was like, "Wow, that's interesting. Wonder when that's oh, it's going to happen to me now." Anyway, that's an aside. So maybe I'll post videos of me just like clipping my ear hair and like, "Fuck you," <laughs> no context. <laughs> well, uh, that'll be timely because I am going to be reading a book next about ageism. So I'll, I'm sure I will have a lot to say about that. Um, all right. Well, some more quotes from the book to discuss, shall we? Almost like we're having a little book club discussion here, even though you haven't read the book, Jason. Uh, in the beginning, uh, there was something I highlighted that that's interesting rereading it because it doesn't seem as profound to me in this moment, but maybe it is. The chapter starts off by, by saying that technology proposes itself as the architect of our intimacies. It is seductive when what it offers meets our human vulnerabilities. Digital connections and the sociable robot may offer the illusion of companionship without the demands of friendship. Our networked life allows us to hide from each other, even as we are tethered to each other. That's interesting because I think connection without real intimacy is what is what this is about. That that's how I interpret that statement is it's offering us the connection that we so desperately want, but it is a connection without real emotional depth and without any stakes. Like to, to your point about online dating, I think online friendships for the most part, Whitney, and, and this is a sweeping generalization. That's why I say for the most part. If I think about, again, the, the, the acquaintanceships that I have that are only through social media, again, they don't have my phone number. They don't have my email. They don't know where I live. It's the illusion of intimacy. I don't actually have that deep or that profound or that intimate of a connection to the people I only know online. It doesn't, and I want to clarify this with my earlier statement, doesn't mean I don't value those connections. I do. But the level of value in my life with my relationships are really based on intimacy. 
And when I say intimacy, I mean, how deep are we sharing? How much of ourselves are we showing each other? Are we there to support one another, not only in the times of triumph, but the times of struggle and suffering? You know, intimacy is such a layered, nuanced type of thing, if you think about it. Like, how do we engender feelings of intimacy with another person? And I think that might be specific to each person. What might make you feel like you have an intimate connection, Whitney, may be very different than me because of my particular emotional or physical needs. But I, I think the point here is that what she's saying in this in this book is we have the illusion of connection. I have, you know, I have 35,000 people following me. I have 50,000. Oh my God. But how many of those people do you, A, actually ever talk to, ever have any meaningful, deep, real, resonant communication with? Or three, would they come to your birthday party? Would they come to your wedding? Would they message you when you're having a crisis in your life? I mean, it, this really, to me, is the separation between uh, connection and intimacy being two very different things. Very different. Yep. And that leads into another statement in, in the introduction of this book is people are lonely. The network is seductive. But if we are always on, we may deny ourselves the rewards of solitude. Which also ties back into your desire to deactivate your Instagram, I imagine, Jason. And I think about this a lot because, as I've said in some recent episodes, when I have, I was going to say forced myself, which is a pretty accurate statement, when I've structured my day to not use social networks, especially TikTok, I find it a fascinating experience. Time slows down. I experience boredom that I haven't experienced in a long time. I start to think very differently, act differently, make different choices. The whole experience is very, very different when I allow myself to be off and off in terms of off those networks, you know, but they are seductive. And I think because of loneliness, a lot of people use that. Although, as I've said in our loneliness episode last week, I, or two weeks ago, maybe, um, I don't consciously experience a lot of loneliness. That's not what draws me to technology as far as I'm aware. I think I'm drawn out of curiosity. I'm drawn for coping. Sometimes I'm just want the mental stimulation and excitement. It's like a, a bit like a drug. And it's really fascinating when I am aware of that and I still choose to use it. And I'm like in this conscious state of examining how social media is making me feel. And I don't find solitude that stimulating, but maybe it's not meant to be stimulating. Like maybe that's the point <laughs> is like when we're always on, we're denying ourselves. Like maybe being off is about, maybe being on is about being stimulated and being off is about being unstimulated, but that's okay. And we've become addicted to this, to stimulation, certainly. And, and going back to my point that she digs into in the first section of the book as kids, you know, like what does that do to our brains to be using things like Tamagotchis and Furbies? And like, I remember that like for me, I, do you remember this Jason? Or was this after your time? Teddy Ruxpin? I feel like that was, did that come out when you were little? Oh yeah. Yeah. Teddy, Teddy Ruxpin was my era. Uh, Tamagotchis and Furbies were, were past my my youth. That was more like um, my younger cousins, uh, the the nieces and nephews of the the young women I was dating at the time. That was like that was like a mid that was like a mid to late nineties. I was already a teenager or early twenties by the time that stuff came out. But I was definitely in the era of uh, Cabbage Patch, Teddy Ruxpin. Um, I think in the eighties or early nineties, I remember when, and this really kind of freaked me out. Um, I remember classmates, young women of mine getting 
uh, the babies, the toy, the toy babies that would burp and vomit and you had to change their diapers. And I was like, wow. And I remember back then thinking, this is some really kind of insidious programming. It's like, oh, you're a young woman. And so we're going to condition you to be a mother because that's how you actualize your womanhood in the world. So here's a baby that burps and farts and shits. And maybe that's just, I'm like always thinking about like the deeper meaning of why, but to me, to me, it's like, a lot of toys reinforce social stereotypes. If you really think about it, right? Uh, you know, Ken wears blue, Barbie wears pink. This, you know, we talked about this with Dr. Melissa McDonald. If anyone wants to listen to that episode, it's a fantastic episode about gender pronouns and uh, uh, non-binary living in the world. And she talked a lot about this thing, Whitney, where there's this this deep conditioning as children of if you're a boy, you play with these toys and you wear this color and you wear these clothes. And if you're a girl, you wear these colors and play with these toys. So on a level, I really think that those babies that burp and fart and shit and piss and you've got to take care of it like an actual baby is a conditioning tool. Rant over. <laughs> they probably are. And I think that might come up in this book, too, that those babies, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Cause I haven't made it that far. And it's, it's just fascinating how as a kid th they were incredibly exciting and stimulating. And I, I don't remember thinking like if it was a super gender specific toy, but I guess it was like, I don't know if boys would play with it. But maybe boys did want to. And first of all, just because a boy wants to play with a toy, like, you know, again, to your point, Jason, it's not about gender per se. It could just be fascination with animals and fascination with babies and like, what do these things do? And I know I can't do this to a, a real life baby, so I get to experience it and I'm just fascinated by by life ironically. And that actually leads me to another point, which I touched upon briefly, which is what does it mean to be real? She shares this example about when Animal Kingdom opened in Orlando, it was populated with, quote, she even puts it in quotes, real biological animals. And the visitors complained that they were not as realistic as the animatronics. Like the living, biologically living animals were not as realistic because they kept the, to themselves and they didn't display archetypal behavior. So the things that people have been conditioned to believe about animals, probably through movies, was not exhibited in the living creatures. So people started to complain, and I think they had to replace them with animatronics to please the visitors. And then it's like it's completely fucking with your head in terms of what you perceive to be real. But part of her point is that maybe our definition of real is closer in alignment with technology than it is with biological creatures, which then again, when you tie that into relationships... Do people perceive real intimacy to be based on technology? And then I start to think about movies like her with Joaquin Phoenix. And one of her big points, which I think I'm going to get to through some highlights. I don't remember if I saved this or not, but she does talk about how in the future, it's very likely that we will have relationships with AI simply because it doesn't come with all of the inconveniences of an human being yeah but then like where's the risk because i i i would i would venture to say that one of the things that makes relationships richer is that there there's there's something on the line you know when you when you have a difficult conversation for instance where you 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 feel you need to tell another person how you feel or you need to set a boundary or you need to break someone's heart or you need to propose to someone or tell someone you're dying. I mean, it, it, not to you know be morose about all, all of it, but if you think about the pantheon of the human experience, Whitney, to me, one of the layers that makes human connection so rich is that there are elements of relationships that are scary. 
there are elements of relationship that require you to put it on the line, right? And 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 commit to things. And I think if we have, you know, disembodied AI relationships with holograms or cyborgs or God knows what's going to appear by the end of our lives, how rich are those relationships emotionally if say something just exists again let's just say it's it's you know let's just say we we get to the point by the end of our lives where like you can have like a cyborg living with you like a, a, a an ai robot living with you who cooks who cleans you have sex with it you watch tv with it never has any opinions it never opposes you on anything Maybe you order it to program to be subservient to you and just say yes to anything you want at all times. Some people might listen to that and go, that sounds amazing. I'd have a companion who looks human, feels human, isn't human, but does anything I want all the time and just like, yeah, you want to go on a road trip? Great. You want to have sex? Great. You want to cook? me? Okay, awesome. I mean, and th then this raises an interesting question about Hmm. If a being has a consciousness, but it is not a consciousness that we associate with a human consciousness. I mean, we, we, we have this ongoing debate for decades about animal rights and what rights our animals do, even though we can see they are very conscious beings that have the ability to feel pleasure and pain and have complex social relationships. We still struggle in most modern societies to even think about granting animals rights, even though we know they're conscious. So let's say we do get to this point. I mean, this is a bit of a tangent. However, if we did get to a point, Whitney, where we had humanoid cyborg companions running on AI to do our bidding, A, there's no real richness to that relationship because there's no risk and there's no contrast if something's just doing what you want all the time. That's essentially like an indentured servant. But B, what rights do we grant a conscious being like that, that looks human, feels human, acts human, but isn't human? I mean, this this got brought up in, I, I feel like this got brought up in the Blade Runner series with the replicants. You know, we think about clones. And really recently, I know I'm going on a crazy tangent right now, but I read an article this past week that a a, a team of scientists finally sequenced the entire human genome. We had portions of the genome sequenced, but now we have the full human genome sequenced. Essentially meaning that opens the door to human cloning. Like it does. It opens the door to it. Whether we will and the ethics involved in that, I don't know if it'll happen, but you can be sure it's opened the door to cloning. So let's say we have a clone. I mean, it, it, whether or not it's AI, let's say we clone ourselves. What are the rights and the privileges and the dynamics of a relationship with a human clone? I, it's going to get weird. Like by the end of our lives, Whitney, I think it's going to get really difficult and really weird with these conversations. But in conclusion, like if we just want to be in relationship with a thing where it's just doing what we want and agreeing with us all the time, I feel like that would be dreadfully boring, A, and B, it doesn't feel like there's much richness in that kind of relationship to me at all. There's no dynamics there. Well, that leads me to another section of, of the book about authenticity. And Sherry says, authenticity for me follows from the ability to put oneself in the place of another, to relate to the other because of a shared store of human experiences. We are born have families, and no loss in the reality of death. What if relating to robots makes us feel good or better simply because we feel more in control? Feeling good is no golden rule. One can feel good for bad reasons. What if a robot companion makes us feel good but leaves us somehow dim diminished? And then she finishes one point with a phrase that I thought was very timely, although I believe this book may have come out like 10 years ago. I have to go double check. She says, inauthentic is, well, let me get the phrasing right, inauthentic as a new aesthetic. Meaning like, 
the word aesthetic gets thrown around a lot, uh, especially with Gen Zs to describe things. It's like, oh, this is aesthetic. This is my aesthetic. It's like maybe authenticity right now seems to be the aesthetic, but the full phrase here is we look at mass media and worry about our culture being intellectually dumbed down. And she references a book called love and sex, which seems to celebrate an emotional dumbing down a willful turning away from the complexities of human partnerships, the inauthentic as a new aesthetic. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, when you were talking about online dating, I think I talked about this in one of our early, early, early relationship episodes. The, one of the reasons I stopped online dating for good is I felt like it was a commodification experience. It felt like it was shopping for a human online. It was like shopping for a person. Nope, don't want that one. The color's not right. Nope, don't want that one. Don't like her clothes. Nope, don't like the size. Uh, the price seems like a high. I mean, it, it the 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 intel the in the inner conversation was almost like I was shopping for a human. You know, like 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 evaluating them like I would evaluate a car. <laughs> That's what I meant when I was talking about those parameters. It's like I started to feel like I don't know who this person is. And if we are if we are curating our online presence, we're curating our dating profiles, we're making perfectly poised profiles on Instagram and TikTok and all of these things. Like we're constantly curating our online image, constantly. The question is why? To me, it comes down to, well, what are humans wired to want? We're wired to want acceptance. We're wired to want validation. We're wired to want approval. We're wired. When it gets out of control is when we become addicted to those things. We become ad addicted to approval and attention and significance. But all of this technology, to your point, Whitney, is just taking advantage of what's already embedded in the human psyche and what is our drive to connect and, and, and feel worthy in the world. So I think if we realize, oh, this technology is being designed to take advantage of what's going on. Okay, so I'm lonely. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Our friend Adam, who I hung out with yesterday, Adam Yasmin, another former great guest, um, he's been getting bombarded with uh, like hair loss ads. And so he actually took and did a whole montage on his social media, basically where he would have the ad in the background and he'd be making commentary in the foreground about it. And our friend Adam has been been bald for about four or five years, like completely. You know, he he shaves his head and everything. He's like... I'm not worried about my hair loss because I don't have any anymore. So stop marketing me these products because I'm not trying to regrow it. So he sent a message to the company. He called them out on social media and like they keep bombarding him with these ads. He's like, I'm not trying to regrow my hair. It's gone, guys. It's gone. Like I'm not your customer. So to him, it's almost like, I don't know if part of it is like, more the annoyance that he's being targeted by ads that don't are, are not appropriate to him or the fact that these AI advertisements are just looking for bald people, right? Like there's algorithms. It's like, okay, looking for pro profile pictures, profile pictures, bald people. Okay. Bald men. Okay. We're going to just put out an ad campaign to anyone that the algorithm, the AI detects as a bald man online whether or not they want it. The AI must be really great because as you were saying that, a bald man walked by outside the window. Like, what is what is going on? What if we're, Whitney, what if we're in a simulation? What if we are living in a fucking, that's a whole nother topic we can dig into. There's the simulation theory, which actually Elon Musk has talked about. That is a possibility that we are literally just living in a global algorithm designed by some higher higher mind. Who the hell knows? But that's pretty weird. Going back to that loneliness part, that there's another quote that I highlighted here about how people feel drawn to robotic relationships because we're looking for no-risk relationships that stave off loneliness. I mean, in a way, though, we like to your point, Jason, 
I think a lot of people use the online dating sites as entertainment. They use them to get validation. They use them to feel less lonely. And of course, they might use them for sexual pleasure or perhaps to find a companion, right? And that was part of my issue with it, which I don't know if I had fully fleshed out when we were talking about this in the past, is that you go on there and you don't know what somebody else's motivation is for using it. So you go on there maybe to find a companion, but you could be exposed or you, or I should say you are exposed to people that have all different motivations. And I remember trying to be so clear about why I was on there and what I wanted and still men would hit me up and I'd think, well, they must have read my profile and through like some of their opening lines, like it seems like they did. And yet I think all, if not most of the men that I met on online dating, like actually went on a date with, like it turned out that they didn't want the same things as me. And I'm like, but I said, clearly this is what I wanted. And that to me is so messed up. It's so messed up. It feels like actually a big manipulation. It feels like crossing somebody's boundaries. Like you don't have enough respect for other human beings to read what they want, to take in what they want. Instead, a lot of men would just like look at my photos and be like, she's a desirable person. I want her attention or I want to have sex with her. I want to go out on a date and, you know, feel good about myself for that time. You know, again, these are assumptions, but that's what it felt like. And that's just such an icky thing. And certainly there are dating apps where you're less likely to have that experience, but I actually chose one. I've only, well, I've been on two dating apps, one more recently and one many years ago in the early days of dating apps, as, as you've talked about too, Jason. (laughs) uh, with your dating app fiascos. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm, they bring back some fond memories and some interesting experiences. So I don't regret being on them, Jason, but just looking back on them with the context of this conversation, it's very frustrating, especially in a city like Los Angeles, where energetically there is such this air of superficial relationships, which is a big generalization because certainly it's not true of everyone here. Clearly, you and I both live here. We're seeking more than that. But that also doesn't mean that you and I haven't used things like social media to feel better about ourselves. You know, like, why did I get on social media? In the fr- I mean, not social media. I meant to say dating apps, but social media would apply too. Like, if I really examine my behavior, maybe I wasn't even conscious of it. Maybe I was going on dating apps to stave off loneliness, right? Like what if I wasn't aware that I was on there just to feel validated? You know, like I was also on there to speed up the process very consciously. I was like, well, I want to meet someone. I want to date someone. I want to fall in love. Like this seems like the quickest route to it. And in a way, like that's taking a shortcut. And when you take a shortcut, there are a lot of drawbacks to it versus, you know, an experience like meeting a future partner at a farmer's market. Yeah. I, I, I think too that I don't know that it's endemic to Los Angeles. I think it's magnified here. I think it's magnified in, 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 in bigger cities, in my experience, which is, uh, but but it's not just a city thing. I th- I think it's definitely part of of Western culture, is um, the upgrade mentality, constantly wanting to upgrade. Right, which is okay. Uh, I had a Honda, cool. Now I finally have enough money and success. I'm going to buy a BMW. BMW is not enough. Now I got to get a Tesla. Tesla's not enough. Now I have the money. I got to get a McLaren. McLaren's not enough. Now I got to get a Bugatti. I mean, this is an whatever. I'm not trying to compare people to inanimate objects, but the mentality is the same. Why should I commit to this thing when I know that there's a bunch of other options out there? 
and that this person, and I'm, I'm signaling LA because I think it's very endemic here, is this climbing of the social ladder and increasing your status in the ho- social hierarchy. And part of that is through dating. Part of that is absolutely through dating. And I, I, I think it skews the intent of why certain people go into relationships because they're not being upfront about it. I think if a lot of humans were, were, were to really look at this, I'm not saying everyone, but I think a lot of people, it's some version of upgrade culture. Well, yeah, but, but, but by this age, I'm supposed to be driving this car and I want to be with this person. And, and why though? Because we've associated that the people we surround ourselves with, the things we have, the zip code we live in, the house we're in, are somehow a reflection of our inner character. Like, I think that's been a huge lie that the capitalist system has like implanted in all of us, that our things and the people we have define who we are, right? What, what's the old trope, Whitney? What, you're, you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. No, okay. I, I, and, and, and I'll, t- I'll tell you why. Because, yes, certain quote successful, financially well-off people that we have met. Yeah, okay. They surround themselves with other influencers and other entrepreneurs and other millionaires and blah blah. That's fine. But some people, they have friends they've known for forty, fifty years. They're like, yeah, this this person is. I love them because I love them. I don't love them because they're also a millionaire and they're also an influencer and they're also a mover and shaker in my industry. Like, no, they just love them because they love them. So I, I'm not saying it's false, but I think that these tropes and these quotes and these ideas that in order to be successful, if you want to be a millionaire entrepreneur, you better start hanging out with other millionaire entrepreneurs. Mm. I don't know that that's true. I think th- I, I understand what, what those kind of statements mean is if people are focused on wealth, abundance, scaling. So yeah, of course, you will learn things and you will connect and maybe give value back to those kind of people. But thinking we have to have that structure, what I think it starts to do for me, on my opinion only, it creates transactional manipulative relationships of I need to seek this person out because they're going to help me be successful. What kind of value can I give this person in exchange for their wisdom? It's not an actual relationship anymore. Now it's a transaction. But we've been parroted this in the online world of that's what we need to do to be a success. But to me, that's a reductive way of approaching relationships because it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a deeper connection. It's a transactional thing. What can I give this person in exchange for their intimacy and their wisdom so I can be as as successful as they are? I don't want to have relationships like that. Maybe I'm shooting myself in the foot. Maybe I won't be as successful. But to me, that feels like a reductive approach where I'm turning relationships into a tit-for-tat transaction. And I personally do not want to manifest relationships like that. I don't want them. Well, you touched upon something I meant to say too about like the culture that I feel in in cities like Los Angeles, which is like transactional relationships are the status quo. It's like, yeah, of course we use each other. Like that's just how things are done. Oh, you're not okay with it? Well, that's how things are done. So just get over yourself. And I felt that way about online dating. It was like, well, yeah, of course, like, I just want to hook up with you, this whole hookup culture we have. And then it just gets embedded in our heads. I mean, as a woman who's interested romantically in men, like just the idea of like, oh, men are dogs and all men want our sex and men take advantage of you. And like, it's just like beaten into you where you don't trust men anymore or I, I, I certainly have struggled to trust men. And then I've also dated men who have that same mentality about themselves and believe that it's acceptable. It's acceptable to treat someone like a transaction. It's acceptable to have hookup culture. And like, it's been a a big battle for, for me, someone who deep down is drawn to monogamy or at least like a sense of deep connection with somebody. Monogamy doesn't necessarily have to be part of that equation, but someone that just yearns to have a deep relationship with everybody in my life and the heartbreak I felt and and sometimes even very subtle levels. Like I, I don't know if I've ever shared this on the show, but Jason, you certainly no, like there was one person I met through online dating and, and I was really into him at the time, 
enough to like continue pursuing the relationship. And one time we were on a date and I saw the notification from the dating app coming, come up on his phone. Like he asked, it was like one of those classic, like cinematic moments where he asked me to take a picture of him. And as I picked up his phone, to take a picture of him, I saw the notification come up and we were on a date and I just felt so sad in that moment. And it ruined the relationship. I could never trust him again. And I didn't in the time we were like new to dating. We only dated for a few months at the time. I didn't have the confidence to bring it up to him. I just internalized it. I didn't feel comfortable asking him about it. And I also, I think due to this culture we're dis discussing, Jason, I also felt like, oh, like, is it inappropriate or out of line? And technically, no, it wasn't. But like, because of the way that I have perceived dating culture, I thought, oh, like, I don't want to be that girl that asked him if he's seen other people. You know, like I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't ready at that point. I think at that point we had only been dating for like a few weeks. So I was like, oh, it's too early. I don't want to like be that girl that wants to be exclusive yet, you know, and like that in itself, that mentality that I've internalized as a woman of like walking on eggshells around men, which is like towards the beginning of many relationships. Like I'm going to be the cool girl. I'm going to be the girl that's like, Oh, I don't care. Like, let's not talk about it. Like, let's not set these boundaries. And I think I, I, became that way or allowed myself to act in that way because that's what I was perceiving. That's how I was interpreting dating culture. It's like if, you know, and you see this on platforms like TikTok, Jason, like these messages that get put out and the way that like men will make fun of women for like being clingy and all things like, oh, you don't, you don't want to be a guy who's whipped by his girl. Like there's a lot of these like messages that come up through social media messages that come up through TV shows and movies about critical comments, little digs at women or digs at men for their behavior and relationships. And then it's like becomes cringy and you don't want to be that person. You don't want to show up in that way. And I think we, many people, not all, of course, like will internalize these behaviors about, well, if I want to be the sexy, cool woman, then I better not do X, Y, Z, at least not in the beginning stages of relationships. I don't want to scare them away, I think is what it is. You know, like if I say, if I ask for too much in the beginning, then that's going to scare away uh, somebody which of course saying it out loud is silly because like if asking for something that I need scares someone away, then he's probably not a good match, but it's still scary. It's still very vulnerable. And I think at that time I felt incredibly vulnerable in that, you know, dating dynamic that we had, I didn't feel the courage. I didn't have the courage to speak up for myself. And so I let it eat me away. And that's eventually why we stopped dating is because I couldn't overcome that trauma that I experienced recognizing that he was still entertaining the idea of other women. And to your point, Jason, who knows what he was doing? I never asked him, but in my head, I'm like, well, he could be going out on other dates. He could be, you know, sitting on the app, swiping through, which what does that mean to me? I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough to be the only girl that he's dating. I'm not good enough. He has to continue looking for other prospects, which just like made me feel so gross. And maybe that was it too. It's like that f internalization of not being good enough for him, like caused me to feel so weak that I didn't have that confidence to speak up for it because I took it upon myself when truly it was more about him than it was about me. Because you, because you didn't necessarily have like a, a container of exclusivity or monogamy around that relationship, was it was it also that like you didn't feel special? Was that was that part of it? Sure. I mean, I I think <laughs> for me in general, that's that's a a desire to feel special, which I think um, millennials tend. It's a quality that many of us have. The desire to 
feel important and seen and heard and like it get but it gets to the point where I I'm not competitive in that way Jason so I think that was the other element it's like sure I, I'm absolutely I'd like to feel special and important in a relationship but I'm also not somebody that wants to ask am I special you know like I don't I don't want it to feel forced <laughs> I want it to be organic like I organically quote earns the specialness title or, or someone just perceives me that way. And that's just what it is. So yeah, I'm sure that was part of it. And it sucks. I mean, if, if that's one of your core wounds of not feeling good enough as it is for me, like that's a really painful thing. Whereas some women I'm sure would see that and be like, eh, whatever, maybe, you know, but this is what I mean. Is it a true whatever or is it that the culture has conditioned somebody to feel whatever? Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I think that's why cities like Los Angeles, New York City, like you're often encouraged to develop a tough skin, which is really heartbreaking to me. Like, why? Like, if deep down you're a sensitive human being, you're going to like create some artificial armor just so you can cope with the disappointment that's you're faced with through dating and work. And no, like I want to feel what I feel and express who I am. Why do I have to build up a tough skin just because I live in an area where you're encouraged to, it seems that seems gross to me. And that's part of what I mean. It's, this whole dating culture that we have, I think encourages men and women to relate to each other in some fascinating ways. If you have a series of coping mechanisms that are like designed to blunt your emotional response or somehow, you know, mute your sensitivity to disappointment or sadness or trauma or any of those things. Well, what's, you know, what's the logical conclusion? You spend all of these relationships um, sort of blunting this, as you said, Whitney. Well, then when you finally find a person you want to be with that you do feel connected to, perhaps then all of that conditioning and all of that practice of us blunting our relationship or blunting our emotional responses doesn't allow us then to connect that deeply with the person we actually want to be with. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think the potentially natural consequence of this behavior is you you practice walling yourself off, or as you said, Whitney, having a thick skin. But I think in some ways that stunts our ability to deeply connect with a person we really want to once we meet them, because we're in the habit of suppressing emotions, not crying, not feeling things. So in a way, these behaviors to keep us safe or prevent sadness, prevent trauma, I didn't really care about them anyway, that type of behavior. It's not like all of a sudden that switch is just going to get flicked off when we meet someone we care about. We're a result of the behaviors we do consistently that become habits. So if we're in the habit of stunting our emotions and blocking those, what, we're automatically just going to feel everything when we meet the right person? No, we're going to have to recondition ourselves to actually feel again. So this strategy, in my opinion, is eventually going to backfire. Yeah. And there's so many elements to this, right? In terms of what backfires, like another point in here that we can really relate to is how online you can be slim, rich, buff. You can feel like you have more opportunities than in the real world. We can edit our messages until they project the self we want to be. And I think that's what happens on social media a lot to the point where catfishes are becoming more and more common because collectively we've edited ourselves so much. Like we're not really who we project ourselves to be. And we're getting to a point too, Jason, where that's so acceptable That's the norm. And I don't know if I feel like we touched upon this in another episode. It's like that makes some of us very uncomfortable because we want it to be real. But like if you think about her point about how visitors at Animal Kingdom prefer animatronics over the real 
animals, the biologically real animals, perhaps the animatronics feel real to them and that's enough because they satisfy them, they please them. And maybe that's why it's so acceptable for us to modify ourselves online because it's pleasing to the eyes of others. Yeah, the downside of this though, and this has happened an innumerable number of times, where I will meet someone that I'm only familiar with from their online presence, and then I meet them IRL, and it's like, whoa, you don't look or act or behave the way that your online persona does. Fascinating. Is that a quote, bad thing? I don't know, I don't know that I wanna label it, but it's fascinating to meet someone and go like, you're not how I thought you would be at all. And that has happened so I, more times than I can count. So again, it's like, maybe, you know, maybe it's kind of like the old trope, Whitney, of, um, uh, you know, artists that create these alternate personas on stage, um, you know, where, where they, they have a stage name they have a stage persona. They have a thing that they do where they're building a brand to sell records, sell movies, sell books, whatever it is. But then in real life, they're someone com you know completely different. I, again, I don't want to label it as a bad thing because I think in the entertainment world, this is not new to social media. This is something that's been happening in other artistic industries for many years. You have this, this being who on stage in music videos, whatever is this person, you meet him in real life and you're like, oh, I'm not, they're not how I thought you would be at all. And they're like, yeah, because that is a persona I created. So this isn't a new precedent. I think it's just taken on maybe a deeper level of significance because more people are doing it. It's not just a few rock stars changing their name and creating a persona. Now a lot of people are doing it. But it's blurring, it, it blurs the line between, I don't know, illusion and reality. And it goes back to, again, one of the overarching questions of this episode, what's really real? And to that point as well, and actually going back to something that you had said earlier, <laughs> I love the way that Sherry articulates all of this. She said, the world is now full of modern gold Goldilockses, people who take comfort in being in touch with a lot of people who they also keep at bay. It's like, oh, it feels good to be in touch with all these people, but I'm going to keep you at a distance. I'm going to pretend that I'm someone else. I'm going to always be looking for Mr. Or Mrs. Wright, the right friend. Everybody's disposable. She says, with constant connection comes new anxieties of disconnection, a kind of panic. Our new devices provide space for the emergence of a new state of the self, itself, split between the screen and the physical real wired into existence through technology. All of this makes us fluent with technology, but brings a, sen a set of new insecurities. They nurture friendships with social networking sites and then wonder if they are among friends. They're all connected. All they are connected all day, but are not sure if they have communicated. That line, you're connected all day, but are not, not sure if you have communicated. They become confused about companionship. Their digitized friendships played out with emoticon emotions, so often predicated on rapid response rather than reflection, may prepare them at times through nothing more than their superficiality for relationships that could bring superficiality to a higher power, that is, for relationships with the inanimate. They come to accept lower expectations for connection. And finally, the idea that robot friendships could be sufficient. Overwhelmed by the volume and velocity of our lives, we turn to technology to help us find time. But technology makes us busier than ever, and ever more in search of retreat. Gradually, we come to see our online life as life itself. Hasn't all of this been completely exacerbated by the global pandemic we've all been in? Certainly it has. And I think everything that you're describing, Whitney, the dial has just been ratcheted up because 
most countries were on lockdown of some kind. So all of these things about the line between, you know, the online life and I don't even know what you want to call it, physical third dimensional life, it's more blurred than ever. Further down this chapter, she says, the triumphant narrative of the web is the reassuring story that people want to hear and that technologists want to tell. But the heroic story is not the whole story. In virtual words and computer games, people are flattened into persona or person personae. <laughs> Our social networks, people are reduced to their profiles. On our mobile devices, we often talk to each other on the move and with little disposable time. So little, in fact, that we communicate in, in a new language of abbreviation in which letters stand for words and emoticons for feelings. We don't ask open-ended, how are, how are you? Instead, we ask the more limited, where are you? What's up? We are increasingly connected to each other, but oddly more alone in intimacy, new solitudes. Technology presents itself as a one-way street. We are likely to dismiss discontents about its direction because we read them as growing out of nostalgia or a ludite impulse or as simply in vain. But when we ask what we, quote, miss, we may discover what we care about, what we believe to be worth protecting. We prepare ourselves not necessarily to reject technology, but to shape it in ways that honor what we hold dear. So, of every technology we must ask, does it serve our human purposes? A question that causes us to reconsider what these purposes are. That feels like a good spot to end on. And you know how sometimes you're just like, that, that feels like a good end point. This is a very complex conversation. And for you, dear listener, if this idea of connection versus intimacy, online relationships versus real relationships, finding the meaning in all of this, if this subject matter today really resonated with you or piqued your interest or sparked your outrage, we have no idea how you're feeling. Let us know how you feel. Shoot us an email directly. It's hello at wellevator.com, W E L L E V A T R.com, which is also our website. We always love to know how you feel. And when we get those personal emails from you, it feels intimate because oftentimes the emails we do get are sharing a lot about people's personal lives, their emotional struggles, their reflections on the subject matter. So if you feel compelled to weigh in, please shoot us a direct email. It's always so wonderful to hear your perspectives on these subjects. And you can also DM us. A lot of people prefer to DM us on, on Instagram. And we always love to hear your perspectives and your reflections on these. That being said, for all the resources, including the book Alone Together that Whitney is referencing, you can find all of those in the show notes and our transcript for this episode. Again, at wellevator.com. Go to the podcast section. It'll take you to the transcript and the show notes for everything we mentioned in this episode. And if you want to listen to any of the previous episodes we mentioned with people like Adam Yasmin, Melissa McDonald, the great, great luminaries and teachers that we've had the blessing to host here on the podcast, all of that will be in the show notes and the transcript for you. Um, it's interesting, Whitney, because you know you and I have this this very small event that we're going to, and. Uh, I feel some interesting emotion since we've talked so much about connection and intimacy during this episode. So it, it'll be interesting to see how we both feel going to this gathering. Um, so wish us luck, dear listener. <laughs> we'll probably comment it on it in a future episode of This Might Get Uncomfortable. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate your listenership, your reviews, your shares on social media. And we'll be back with another episode really, really soon. Thank you so much.